Thank you. It was a big project. It was uh, a real experience and a real challenge, and it was real fun as well. It is the largest new cultural center in the world. It's uh, in Kuwait, and it has a site which has five complete museums on it and a whole load of other buildings and support structures that, that support the whole thing. We're lighting designers, Sutton Vane Associates. We design lighting for uh, ecclesiastical projects and cathedrals. We do a um, uh, really fun modern sculpture. We did a big chunk of the Olympic Park, now the Elizabeth Park here in London. And we do lots of displays and museums and projects like that. So when Cultural Innovations, the designers of this huge project asked us, um, we thought, this is going to be great. And it was great, but it was a challenge. Big is the word. So this now, it's now finished. It's now open to the public. There it is. And you walk in through that huge entrance and you uh, get on the site. And there's a museum there on the left and another complete museum on the right. And do you see those tiny people in the distance? That gives you an idea of how big these buildings are, because until you kind of see that, you don't realize. And so you walk on to the end of that photograph, and there's a couple more huge museums. And I love those stonking big sculptures, because they just throw the whole scale completely out. I mean, they are huge, those green and blue and amazing sculptures. And you walk on, and there's more. And it just, it's just huge. It is absolutely huge. So, we were really, really excited to be asked to do the lighting. 22,000 square meters of gallery. I mean, if you think that a normal museum gallery might be 200, 500 meters, square meters, we had 22,000 square meters of galleries, plus all the support space, plus the educational spaces, plus the lecture theaters, plus all those other things that, that went with it to make this, this amazing place work. The first thing we did is we looked at the daylight. This is Q8. The sun is bright. And we knew there would be problems where sun would be coming in and causing challenges. So we did a complete full sunlight analysis right throughout the year for every single gallery. This is just one. And uh, this gallery's got windows down the kind of bottom side. You can probably sort of see you as bits of red cheeking, creeping in. And then you look at the color, color. The red is kind of like um, thousands of lux. Um, and so that kind of thing was not acceptable. So we worked closely with the exhibition designers, cultural innovations, and with the architects, SSH, and developed daylight management systems. Um, part of this, of the displays, uh, no, a lot of the displays were going to be quite modern things. So we were lucky. We didn't have very much uh, 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 exhibits that were going to fade in bright light, and that, that made our life a lot easier as lighting designers. But, the project was incredibly fast. It was so fast that it opened in about two years after we were commissioned. And when we were commissioned, they hadn't dug a single bit of anything in the ground at all. So in order to do such a huge thing so fast, we had to design the lighting before the exhibits were designed. Because the contractor, the electrical contractor, had to start wiring it and building it. And a thing of that size, you need a lot of person power to actually build it. So they had to start on site, even though what was going to be lit wasn't designed or chosen. So we designed a kind of generic kit of parts that could light almost anything that the designers could come up with. And that was... We, so then, when we arrived on site, there, we, we had enough flexibility to get the lighting to work, to light whatever was there. This is uh, one of the galleries in one of the museums, has a complete living forest. And 
live trees need a lot of light to keep them alive. So we worked with the planting specialists and uh, we worked out what kind of lighting would be needed and we actually decided to do the whole thing backwards. We would light the trees for daylight at night because the intensity they needed to stay alive was so high it would have been uncomfortable for the visitors going around. So we decided we'd just flip the whole thing and that visitors would go around in what they thought was bright, but what the trees thought was gloomy. And then once the visitors had gone in the evening, bang, on would come these high-power growing lights for, given whatever it was, they needed 12 hours of really bright light. And so that, that was the scheme we had. You can sort of see there's a kind of walkway through the, through the trees here. And uh, we had real fun with that forest. So we designed the scheme. It was all built on site, lots of site visits to Kuwait to see, make sure how it was all going. And then we got to the stage where we had to aim and program and focus. A bit more than 20,000 lights. That was a big job. So we had to make complete schedules for, for the team from Sartan Vane Associates as when people were going to be on site, what museum they were doing, who was going to be there to support them. You know, we had to have not just art us, but we had to have the right people to access the, the, the parts of the building, we had to have the right maybe audiovisual people if the lights interacted with the audiovisual. Maybe we had to have the right people who could open the right showcases so we could aim lights carefully on things in cases. So just the sheer logistics was a challenge. Okay, some of the galleries are 14 meters high inside. Yeah, you can't, <laughs> 14 meters is really high. So the lights were focused by a team of abseilers. These guys were amazing. They were from Nepal. Nepal is where Everest is, so they had a lot of practice. They were so nimble and they were so skilled. But the challenge was they only spoke Nepalese, nothing else at all. Their boss, who's one of the guys there, spoke Nepalese and Arabic. I don't speak Arabic, and nor does any of my team. So we had to get somebody who could translate English to Arabic, and then he could then translate Arabic into Nepalese, and then the Nepalese was shouted 14 meters up. And we had a little school. We sat down with examples of all the fittings that were up there, and we explained very simple language. That rotate, that means you turn this bit here. Adjust the beam angle, that means you turn the lens on the front, you know, what's clockwise, what's anti-clockwise. And, you know, and these guys are up there hanging backwards, so what's their anti-clockwise, you know, compared with me 14 meters down below, three languages away. It was, it was fun. So we practiced on a low fitting. This is, this is in, the, in, the, in the jungle gallery, as you can see a bit in the background. And, we, um, and, and there they are. And then from then on we were able to do to work our way through bit by bit. Um, actually, I learned a bit of Nepalese, it was quite fun. <laughs> so this is, this is that gallery, pretty much finished. So to give you an idea of the scale, this is half of one gallery, and there were about four or five galleries of this size in this one museum. So there's then another five museums. Yeah, big. So, there's a complete waterfall in here, like a huge aquarium, loads of living trees, um, loads of other trees, loads of artificial trees to help boost the whole thing and make it look good. Quite amazing. So there's the walkway. There's a walkway 10 meters up in the air, and you walk along this walkway, and you go through, through the trees. It turned out when we got there, no one actually told us that there'd been a design change, and... Um, all these trees you can see here are all plastic. <laughs> they decided to have virtually no living trees at all. So we had about 100 luminaires up there, each of which could deliver 26,000 lumens in order to make the poor trees live. And we've been told, you know, if a big tree dies, that is catastrophic, because to get a big tree out, you can imagine, out of here, you've got to dig it up, you've got to have special equipment to lift it, and, you know. So we had gone out of our way to make sure there was enough lumens in that space to keep these these trees alive, turns out they were plastic. In fact, and being plastic, they actually didn't want too much light because it might fade. Luckily, they were dimmable. So um, we just dimmed the, the growth lighting down hugely. And this is the kind of theatrical lighting that, that we put in. Um, this whole gallery 
has got two complete scenes. It can have normal visitors' lighting, or it can have party lighting, which is lots of colour and fun. And at, when this shot was taken, there's actually a little bit, you see the little hint of colour down there, because that's a bit of the party lighting creeping in. Some of the scenes got a bit muddled up as, as they were taking photographs. Um, but, but that was just part of the fun of the whole thing, so that they could have special receptions and drinks and things there. So as you walk around, it's all dapperly and nice. That was part of the experience, to make you think you really were in a forest. And you walk down the walkway. And then you go down a travelator, where there's lots of gobos and moving shapes and things, all a bit freaky, in order to make you get a bit scared, because you're going down to the, the, the jungle floor. And these things all change. And it's the only light in this travelator, is just the light that comes off these moving gobos. And then you arrive at the forest floor. And sure enough, there are freaky, frightening animals. There's a, it's a tiger -y thing there at the bottom, as you can see. And again, we've got a bit of the party lighting on, hence the colour. Um, and it's just huge. Um, and these, all these trees, you can, all, all, all these roots, they're all, they're all artificial, actually. And then there's an aquarium. So that was a challenge, because if aquariums get too bright, they grow algae. So we had to keep the aquarium dim while lighting the trees brightly. Then it luckily it turned out we could treat, light the trees less, less brightly, so that kind of worked all right. Again, you get an idea of the scale. Look at the size of those people in, right in the, in the distance. Aquarium. And another gallery. Huge amounts of glass, so huge amounts of daylight. But, so the lights were hardly used during daylight. But at night, these are monstrous extinct animals, huge mammals. But we had to light the underside of that shark you can see hanging up there. So I always like to hide lights away. So, so the lights that hit the underside of that huge shark thing are, are hidden away there, just in, in, in the top of that graphic panel. So no one can see them. And I like that kind of thing very much, because it's the story is the, what the displays is not the features. When you've got things hanging in the air, you need to uplight them. So we uplight the bottom in this transport gallery of all the aeroplanes. Get a bit of contrast, a bit of fun. Some galleries were high contrast deliberately, some were low contrast. And this amazing creation, this all changes. It's got loads of spotlights on it that, that pick out you know, a lobster or an insect or something. And so the whole thing is just gently changing the whole time throughout the day. And uh, here's one of, one of the team adjusting. You see, there's a whole mass of light lights down there in the middle. And they, uh, they, we had to get them aimed one onto each of those creatures so that they could all change and things. You can't, the public can't see those lights. This is an interactive. It tells the story of how thunderstorms work. And it's linked with really powerful, fantastic light, uh, music and, and sound of thunderstorms. And it changes, and the fiber optics make rain that comes cascading down. And we developed this with the UFO, um, and it is a truly huge and impressive exhibit. And sometimes just the sheer precision of lighting that we could do was really good fun. So we just outlined every single structural line in, the, in that display. And it becomes a, a beacon. It becomes a walk this way and look at the information I've got here to tell you. There were whole galleries of real life-sized dinosaurs. And it was good to make them again tell their story, to emphasize what parts of that dinosaur made it exciting, to make sure that the eye twinkled and the teeth were kind of obvious, because that's what made it real fun. So, we had to uplight the pterodactyls to make them really look as if they were soaring. I mean, what amazing creatures anyway, aren't they? They're incredible. So these are, all, these are all real life size. And here you can see the blinds, because th that was part of our daylight studies that we did to work out how the, the natural lighting worked. Tens of thousands of LEDs all programmed to imitate um, blood cells circling on huge, great glowing bacteria in your blood, how they work, how they attack, what they do. In the Space Museum, complete spaceships. Make them shine, make them sparkle, make them look good. 
and outside, more space exhibits. And finally, this is a complete planetarium onto which we projected um, visions of what the moon might look like, or the sun, and a whole string of planets, just to give a bit of life and a bit of movement. And so, that's how we worked. That's how we did this biggest cultural center in the world. With teamwork, working closely with a fantastic team of designers, by planning everything ahead, by having a soft fit solution, and then spending literally months on site, aiming and making the exhibits look exciting and make them tell their stories so the visitors could understand the message of that incredible exhibition. Thank you.